stories about the war on data. I'm, um, I'm Hobson Lane from Sharp Labs. We're the uh, research center for um, Sharp Corporation in Japan, and we're located in Portland, Oregon. We have a bit of an open mind about uh, things like Yetis and Sasquatch and even unicorns. Um, so I'm going to try something a little, little different today. today. Um, if you want to vote for any one of these stories that you'd like to hear more about, um, just break out your phone and dial in this number and have it ready for uh, the, as it comes up. If you want to ask questions about it, I'll go back to those slides at the end and we can talk about it further for whoever wins. So this is the sort of unicorn aspect of it. I'm not a developer, a front end developer, but I've tried to incorporate a little web server running in the background to keep track of all your votes. So. Um, the first lesson I want to talk about, or the first war story, is imagine yourself um, being called into a control center for a remote vehicle, a spacecraft, an aircraft, um, a robot, a balloon, and it's, it's out of control. It's tumbling, it's spinning, and you can't tell how fast. Um, so everybody, there's a dozen people in the room all looking at computer screens, checking out this, this stream of data flowing in from the, the vehicle. Um, and you're, you're desperate to prevent yours from ending up on the front lawn of the White House, like, uh, like it just happened recently. And so, and the executives, of course, are breathing down your, your back because back, this is a, an extremely expensive vehicle. And, um, and so all your, all your nav sensors are pegged. They're, uh, they're indicating, they're not giving you any information. So everybody turns to the, uh, the solar panel guys, and they're, and they're seeing some cycles in the data. They're seeing... Um, periodic cycles, which indicates the tumble, and everything's great, awesome. So now we've got some information about how fast we're spinning. At least we can start to get this thing under control. Um, so you measure the period between these cycles, and you get 12 seconds. Um, how many think that this vehicle was actually tumbling at this rate? And show of hands, is it tumbling at this rate? And we give you three options. At this rate, faster than this rate, or less than this rate? Question. Yes. <laughs> it's negligible relative to the sun. The sun is so much brighter than we're 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 high enough that it doesn't matter. So um, yeah, good question though. So you got three options: less than, equal to, or more than 12 seconds tumble rate. So less than, less than less than in seconds. So it's faster, tumbling faster. Nobody. Okay. Okay. Uh, 12 seconds tumble rate because that's what the data says. Faster. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Longer, longer period, slower tumble rate. Anybody? Anybody have any guesses? Well, it turns out you, you first guys were right. Um, it's, it's, um, it's tumbling much faster. Um, there's actually, the, but you're actually all wrong in the sense that nobody can actually know. Uh, the data was sampled at such a low rate that um, it was aliased, and there's absolutely no way to know whether it was at that rate or, or faster. Or you do know that it's not tumbling any slower than that, but, um, but you don't know that it's not tumbling much faster than that. So, uh, so that was, this, is, this is the war story of, of paying attention to Nyquist, Nyquist sampling. I don't know if you've, um, I'm sure you've all um, studied Nyquist uh, sampling theory, but any, sampling um, concept. But anyway, basically, you need to sample your data at least twice as fast as the fastest thing that's oscillating in your in your system. And um, and of course, we weren't planning for this incident, so our system wasn't designed to do that. We weren't supposed to use solar panels for navigation, but but we had to, and so we had to deal with this. So we almost made the wrong mistake and did the wrong actions on this vehicle, and, and you could have could have been cat catastrophic if we hadn't. Um, taking a moment to, to think about what was actually happening. Um, so um, one, one additional, so this just shows, this is a plot to show how the, um, how the, the, the aliasing happens, how when you sample slower than a faster signal, you get an, an aliased signal that looks much slower. Um, so the obvious solution is then to design into your system an anti-aliasing filter. So, knock out all these high-frequency signals and, and get down to the low ones. Well, you'll see that um, it actually didn't change the period of the signal. Um, it only knocked down the amplitude of it. So if you still only have one major frequency and it's still way out there in a, in a high-frequency range, you're going to still alias it. And it's not going to do any good to have any kind of any aliasing filter. And this is the standard approach. This is what most people do. It's not going to work for you. So don't try it. 
Um, instead, you need to look at a different sister, sis, sensor, a sensor that has higher bandwidth or ha has some different mode of sensing. And so you can obviously look at, you can post-process things like you're, you, you're communicating with this thing, you're sending telemetry back and forth, so it's got a radio signal. And that radio signal is going to have some Doppler smear on it. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's when, when the waves become closer together as a result of moving towards you or away from you. And so you've got part of the, the, the vehicle moving away from you, part of it moving toward you. That's going to smear out the, this, uh, any constant frequency signal coming off your radio. You can measure that, and you've got a, a pretty precise measurement of its tumble rate. That's, that's what we ended up using. Um, you can also do, if you, if you have the op opportunity to, you can design into your system um, sampling irregularly. You might get lucky, and your clock might be very unstable. It might be sampling at random times. And if it does that, awesome. You can actually process that. As long as you know what times it's sampled at, you can post-process po post that. Um, so there's, there's another um, uh, sort of mathematician name that you should put in your back pocket in addition to Nyquist, and that's Loam Scargill. That they, these are people at MIT who developed an algorithm for taking randomly sampled data and producing spectra so you can, get the, you can get all the fundamental frequencies out of a signal based on just completely random sampling. So this is one case where um, low quality is actually pretty good. It helped you out. Okay, next story. Um, story number two. So if you want to vote for this one, you can text that number at the bottom of the, of, of the screen. To, uh, you want to put in one for that first story, and now we're going to meaning of mean. This is one that's been talked about by several other people. Michael Lee at Foursquare taught us that uh, this is a lesson yesterday, that you need to look at more than just the mean. You need to look at the spread, and you need to categorize it before you start um, digging into the mean. So I won't go into too much detail on this because he's done it. But um, so imagine yourself, the new story here is you're trying to predict the utility power consumption of a commercial building, um, a set of commercial buildings. And you're, you're installing systems in all these buildings to, to chop off the, the peak utility consumption. You're storing it, and then you're, you're providing it to them when they get the peak consumption in order to save them money at, at their facility. So these could be buildings like a casino, uh, restaurants, uh, office buildings, uh, this hotel. So let's, let's imagine we're, we're here at this hotel trying to predict how this day is going to go in terms of their power consumption at this building. So the um, first thing you do is you, you plot a bunch of buildings, see how their power consumption goes. So you'd say, um, so this is a plot of various types of buildings and, uh, and their power consumption during the day. Well, um, and then the next thing you might do is you, you categorize according to each individual building. So let's, let's figure out what, what, what this building does on a typical day. And let's average it out. Let's take the mean. Um, and that's um, and that's furthermore. Let's let's look at how it does on each hour of the day or each 15-minute interval, in this case. And so we're averaging over these bins. So we've, we've grouped our data, we've categorized our data before doing the mean, and that helps a lot. And then we need to also look at the spread, as Mike talked about. So we we need to plot the uh, standard deviation above and below. And you can see that the spread here is very large. So this is a typical. This is a timeline similar to the one we saw for Posh. You know, the, the day in the life of the of the customer. This is the day in the life of a building. Um, and so the, the spread is very broad here. And so how can we narrow it down? What, what more categorization or, or slicing can we do to, to bring it down to, to a, a more reasonable level that we can do some prediction on and have some confidence in our prediction? We can see if you start, um, this is an animation showing how it goes through the days of the week. So if you, or obviously, if you start to think about it, you'd realize that days of the week have a big impact on commercial buildings activity. And so, um, and we, you can actually, we, you can talk to your, um, your business owners or, or whatever, and you can figure this out. So um, you can see that, obviously, you can narrow down your scope if you narrow down your slice to a, a more particular class of, of your data, in this case, days of the week. It didn't, it didn't help us a whole lot, but it helped us enough, and we were able to provide templates that uh, were, were useful in this, um, in this third lesson of uh, our war story. Uh, so we're going to continue this, this task of prediction of power consumption in this building, but now we've got a two degree of freedom model of the, of the building's power consumption. Only two uh, parameters to tune, so really easy to tune, um, it's just a filter. And we've, we've categorized by day of the week by doing something clever, by uh, dividing our historical window of these, these thresholds that we're trying to predict um, into the days of the week that are the same as the day we're, we're on and the other days. So that's how we've, we've bend our data. For, so then we have two, so it's kind of a hybrid filter. It's sort of a quantile filter, quantile filter plus a, um, just a standard linear filter. We have coefficients that you multiply by, um, uh, uh, by the, each of these values. And so now we've got 
so we've got, we've got, we can turn these knobs, and one, one of them we called conservatism, and the other one we called um, the window width. I mean, it's just greater, greater data, basically going looking further back in time. So those are the two degrees of freedom we decided to, to tune, and then, and of course, those are distributed then to all the parameters of the model. And so um, you want to search over that space, and you can run an optimizer and find, hey, hey, where, where are we going to get the best performance? Where are we going to get the most um, best match to our training set? Well. Um, well, that's, that, that fails in this particular case because this is a very um, nonlinear system and it has a lot of interesting features. You can see that um, adding more data and increasing our window width almost always helps as you go back to the, to the rear of this slide. It's not showing up very nicely there. But, um, but as you, and, and conservatism also um, tends to reduce your performance, which is what we wanted, we want, but it, it flattens out these curves. Um, but um, you're, it's, it's a trade-off between over, overfitting and performance, obviously. And we've got this additional problem of, in this particular data set, we've got anticline cliffs. Um, if these, as you're, as you're approaching the edge of the cliff, it's going up. So you're getting better and better performance. You're saving more and more money, and that's what you're targeting. But then you fall off the cliff, and then you go up another cliff. And so as you, as you, if you do a, a standard hill climbing algorithm, you'll end up just falling off cliffs and going off the edge. So this is not, uh, it's, it's, you have to do something more broad. So what we ended up doing was just doing a global exhaustive search of all the possible parameters and plotting it like this and finding the peaks and finding the plateaus where it was broad and robust so that we knew that it would be um, not overfitting and not too tight so that it would, um, it would be generalized for, uh, for, for the building in the future. Um, so not adding more data, it turned out to help us a lot. You saw how we found the plateaus way back there with long window ranges, and that makes sense. There's a lot more information if you have a lot of historical data. But sometimes adding more doesn't help. In this case, this particular building, it was, um, it was the, the terrain was very low and very spiky, peaky. And so very difficult to find a nice spot to, to tune this particular model. So we need to come up with something new. So I'll go into more detail about that model um, in one of the later lessons, I think lesson five. So now we've got a, a new problem. Um, I'm, I'm skipping around a bit. Now we're back at Sharp, Sharp Labs. We're trying, to, um, we're trying to predict our return rate on our products. So we've got a lot of product lines. We, we build televisions, microwave ovens, cell phones. And one particular product line we have is, is, is seeing some uh, major increases in return rates. So we're getting millions of dollars worth of, of hardware being sent back to us, and it's costing us a lot of money. We're seeing these big surges pop up periodically. So um, the problem with this is our return rate is convolved with our sales rate. Because as we sell more items, they get returned faster. And so we're seeing these spikes in our sales go up right before we have spikes in returns. So we need to first normalize for that. That's, and, um, and, and so obviously, you don't want to, that's one of the causes that you don't want to, to, to try to knock down. You don't want to. You don't want to design your. Your. You don't want to uh, attack your sales in order to reduce your returns. So um, there's multiple interacting causes, and we need to. We need to find out what those are, and so we need to first normalize by by sales, and uh, we need to. We, we call that lag compensation because there's a lag between the sales, and it's not good enough just to do what Six Sigma tells you to do and divide your rejects by your sales. Um, this is what, if you do a Google search on, um, you know, return rate or, or reject rate, you'll come up with this formula. It looks great. It's really easy to communicate to your supply, to your, uh, supply chain and your, um, and, your, uh, and your channel, your sales channel, so that they can say, hey, we're doing really well on our, our, our rejects. Because it's a simple formula that everybody can understand. The problem is it's wrong. It's a, uh, sorry. The, um, a better, a better approach is to look, obviously, because we've seen this lag between the sales and the returns. So we've got to compensate for lag adjusted sales. So the, um, we can look at the last quarter. Rather than look at this quarter's sales, let's look at last quarter's sales and make that our denominator. That's a little better. It gives us a little bit closer to the right answer. Um, but it's, that's not quite right. And it's late. We've got this, this uh, last quarter window that we're having to average over in order to smooth out all these errors in order to try to get something that's reasonably close to our real return rate. So that's not good enough either. So let's move on. Let's look at um, taking the, uh, 
the estimated lag quarter. So that was, this would be looking at our average lag for our product line for this particular class of things we're looking at. So we might look at a particular model, a particular customer, a particular state in the United States, and we have a particular lag, and then we have an average lag between sales and return in that particular set, slice of data. So we take that um, estimated lag and we use that, the sales over that period for whatever period we're looking at. So we could look at this month and look at the lag this month's sales and that would give us a good, good estimate of returns. And that's even better. And that's what we're currently using and it's, it's working out pretty well for us. But we've got something even better on the works that's, uh, that I'm um, gonna show here today. And this is uh, actually taking the histogram of your lag for that product line. So you have a customized lag histogram. And so why not just convolve it with your, um, with your, uh, with your sales to get what those sales, how those sales would spread out over time. So this is a, a birth death process, pretty, pretty straightforward to model. Um, and you're just gonna, you're gonna take your, your histogram of um, sales. Then you're gonna, you, uh, the, uh, this shows a, a bit of the things we learned about it as we're looking at the sales, as we're going through this process. You can see that there's obviously a monthly, at the end of every month as our salespeople are getting incentivized, there's a, there's a big spikes in sales. This is another review of that first lesson, the Nyquist lesson, that you not, need to not only look at month, monthly data, but you need to look at um, down to weekly data in order to get to real, real patterns in the data. But um, then you look at your reject rate and you see how they're distributed over time. Um, and you get this, this lag curve. So you get, um, and uh, it's, it's this log curve that everybody's been talking about with a long fat tail because every product dies sometime. It's just a matter of when, and it tends to happen way out in the future, for hopefully for most of your products. But some of them happen early. And so this is the lag curve for as your products are returned, um, when they're returned. And, and so this, then you, after convolving that with your sales, you get your lagged sales. So this is the sales that apply to this particular time slot uh, up until today. And you notice you've got a nice little prediction in the future. Okay, so this is the, this is, you can start to even predict your returns as you get this dialed in right. Um, so now we've got this, this entire process that we're using to uh, predict accurately and precisely, not down to the, the quarter or even the month, but down to the week. And uh, because it's, that's just the, the delay we're imposing currently and in, in updating our, our our databases that we're using from, from corporate headquarters. But, but this, um, this is, this is a, as, as good as you can get, this, at least as good as I can get, in terms of estimating very precisely and very quickly and being able to then, so now we've got something we can track and now we've got something that if we make a change, we can tweak and say, okay, that didn't help and didn't help this week, so let's, we can do something again very next week. We don't have to wait for a long time. Um, we, can, we can make adjustments to our process, to our factory um, production line, and, and see what happens. So that's, that's, that's lesson four. I've got some, some other question the question um, lessons um, dealing with natural language processing. So if you guys vote for four, and we still have plenty of time, I'll, um, I'll take a look at that, and we'll, we'll see if um, I'll, we'll dive deeper into this other question of um, how to do natural, uh, unsupervised natural language processing and whether it's right. Because as, as part of this returns reduction effort, we started processing our technician um, notes on what was wrong with the television and trying to, uh, what's wrong with our different products and whether, whether or not to, uh, to um, the, the product as it's, as it's coming into our, um, our returns channel uh, through the call center where they get, they get a, a, a bunch of um, description of the problem with the television and whether that description matches up with the ultimate diagnosis of the technicians at the, at the factory floor. So we'd like to predict whether the television is, or the, the product is actually bad um, before it actually arrives. And so, um, and natural language processing is the way we, we started to pursue to do that. Let's see, trying to skip on through. So this is the, uh, this is uh, the fifth lesson. Um, so um, back to the, the power prediction, um, utility consumption of a particular building. We uh, explored a more complex model than that simple hybrid two degree of freedom model. And so we're, we're looking at now uh, neural nets. And so we start to run into um, another difficulty you might be, uh, might be familiar with. And that's of course not having, enough, um, not having enough data to support the complexity of your model. And so in this case, deep nets, and we're not actually using deep nets, this is, um, it's more, they're more um, shallow nets, but, uh, but these are um, artificial neural networks where we have a single hidden layer and starting to explore how, um, 
and, and the limit of what data we have, because we've got a year or so, or more, maybe more for a particular building uh, of data associated with that building, and whether the degrees of freedom in that, in that data set, the information content, um, is, is justifiable, uh, is, justifies having a, um, a neural net to do the prediction. You see that our, 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 our predictions are doing pretty well. If you, if you just plot the, the error in our, in our predictions relative to the, the truth, um, the, the threshold we're trying to predict, it does pretty well, but it's, unfortunately it's overfitting. Um, this is because there's, there's a lot of degrees of freedom in our model and there's not so much in the, in the data. Um, the, um, so this is a conventional um, deep net training um, formulas and the, 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 the linear algebra required to accomplish that. And, like someone else showed, that we, we use the W matrix for the weight matrix, and then you've got this, um, and you're just updating it um, perpetually with, um, with new information from your training set as you go along. The, um, the problem is the shallow data. So let's look at the model degree. So you've got this S, capital S, with an exponent, which is not really an exponent. It's the, um, it's the index of the layer that you're looking at. So the capital S is the number of... Um, of inputs to that, uh, the number of nodes coming into that, uh, that weight matrix. And so, um, so you need to sum up all of those and, and for, your, for, your model, for your trained data degrees of freedom, you've got a completely different um, uh, set, set of degrees of freedom and that, the formula is shown there. So you've got to, and actually it's, it's a sum, not a product there in the, in the degrees of freedom for the training data. So you sum up the, the inputs and the outputs, how many, what's, what's the dimensions of your inputs and outputs of your neural net, and you multiply it by the number of samples. And that's the degrees of freedom in your data set. So you don't want to exceed that. If you do, you know you're, you're overfitting and you're, you're causing yourself trouble. The, um, and so the model degree of freedom is the, the inputs, the number of inputs multiplied by the number of uh, inputs to the hidden layer, and then the number of outputs. Um, and you need to sum those two bits together in order to get the total degrees of freedom. So the end, end result is, and this is a nice little rule of thumb that you can keep in your back pocket if you're doing neural net tuning or trying any kind of um, cascaded linear filter. Um, the number of hidden nodes, the number in your middle layer, the number of, of um, neurons you have in your middle layer, these be very much, a very small fraction of your, your, the number of training set examples you have. Because it turns out in that formula I just showed, the inputs and outputs, they sort of cancel out um, in terms of the total impact on your degrees of freedom. But the hidden layer, that's the one, or, and you may have multiple ones, and if, if so, you need to multiply them by each other. So if you have two hidden layers, it'd be the in hidden one and in hidden two multiplied together, and that still needs to be smaller than your total number of training set um, examples. There's a Stack Overflow article at this uh, bit.ly uh, link if you want to read more about it. It has a lot of good information about how to automatically tune a neural net. So you don't have to design it. You don't have to decide how many hidden layers to have or how many neurons to put in there. Um, there's a lot of approaches for doing that automatically if you're exploring the possibility of neural nets. Sixth lesson learned, uh, sixth war story, if you will, on data. This, this was more of a war. Okay, so we've got um, at, at, Sharp, at Sharp Corporation, we've got um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of big data. This is an actual an image of the model for one of our databases in, in this, that I was tasked with, uh, with mining. It's, we've got 18 of these, um, 10,000, thousands, thousands and thousands of tables, and of course, hundreds of thousands of fields. This just shows the tables names. This doesn't even show the, the, the fields. And of course, tens of millions of, of records in, per table. So, so we've got tons of data to explore, and, and, and we've, we've heard from, from others about um, the techniques for dealing with that, how to, how to attack it. And so we're going to talk about some here. You know, they're pretty similar, it sounds like, to what has been done in the past. Um, you need some good heuristics for, for exploring that, that graph of connections between each of the fields in, in your databases. Um, uh, but that's very difficult to come by in the case of uh, when, you, when you don't know what your goal is. And so there, there's really no way to use conventional algorithms like A-star search or others to, to search through this graph. So what we've come up with is, um, I think it's similar to what um, someone presented you know, yesterday about how they deal with this problem. It's, you know, it's, it's a quadratic problem. You've got you to you ch check every possible field with every other possible field and calculate the correlation. And that's, that's not doable in the history of the, in the, in the time we have left in the universe. And so, 
so what so what you've got to do is you've got to you can't, you can't do correlation, first off. You've got, to do, you've got to do something more simple, like matching up of metadata. Things like the number of distinct values, the min and max value, the standard deviation, the, the mean. And that if you can do that, you can do those matches in linear time uh, very quickly. So um, that's, that's quite doable. You still, haven't, you still haven't gotten rid of this whole problem of having, um, of having the, to check every field against every other field. The way you get rid of that one is by sorting on your metadata. And so now you can do, you can sort all your fields. So you have a flat list of all your fields everywhere and all their metadata. Sort it, done. So now you can find all the ones that are close together and that's a log in end problem. And so then now you've, now you've got something that's, that's doable. And so that's how we found our initial connections, not only between, um, uh, and so it's, it, was it was able to, it enabled us to then focus on those that are most likely to have connections that were relevant. So places where we could tweak an input and produce an output somewhere else in our, in our system. Um, this talks a little bit more about that complexity, that 10 to the 24th problem that's, gonna, that's not going to happen for us um, and, and how we got it down to more of a 10 to the 13th problem, which is starting to look reasonable. We, don't, we didn't actually use a lot of this. We, uh, we got out of the way of, of the machines for doing uh, the, the processing, and, but we, we also injected ourselves as humans by, by talking to um, business owners and finding out what, what they were finding was actually generating problems with our returns and what, what kind of problems they were seeing and how we could possibly fix them. So we, we, we shortcutted a lot of this. We didn't do all the 10 to the 13th searches, but we, uh, we did a lot of it just to, to, to seed the conversation with our, our, our business managers. Um, let's see. We, ha we had some accidental experiments, um, and that turned out to be very, oops, typo. The, um, the, uh, I guess it's an experiment, uh, let's see who's paying attention. But <laughs> the, uh, we had differences in, in, in our various model lines and how we did things at the factory with them, and of course different feature sets. Those are grand opportunities to look at your return rates across those, uh, those feature sets and across those uh, production line um, processes. And so, um, so we looked at that and we did find some, some very ripe fruit for picking. And we're, we're, we're rapidly uh, reducing those millions of dollars returns per month down to much reasonable le levels and, and vastly improving our, 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 the quality of our, our products. Um, another, um, just more details about some that we can go back to if you're, if you're interested in. All this information, I think I'm running low on time, um, a lot, all this information is, um, is available open source. So these algorithms, a lot of this data, it's all, a lot of it was fictionalized. Um, we've, we've anonymized a lot of it um, to protect ourselves. But, but, there, but it is all available online um, and you can, uh, you can explore it if, you, if you're interested in any of these algorithms or, or just playing around with um, some, of these, some of these things. So now, it's time to put in your votes. It looks like I got a few already. Um, four have voted for the question, the question, and one for deep net on the ground. Um, let's see, anybody else wants to vote for anything to go back to to talk about, or we can just um, open it up for questions? Looks like I gotta go back to question, the question then. So there's no questions. So natural language processing seems like somebody's interested in looking into. So we've got uh, on this open source network, that uh, open source project on GitHub that I just mentioned, we have a, uh, a package for natural language processing that will do something. Uh, in this case, it's, um, it will help you, uh, see if it's gonna work over here, there you go. So you can, you can cluster your data. Um, in this case, this is a Word document graph, and this, these are the words that are all getting uh, pushed to the middle to connect between documents on the left and right that are in the brown. Um, these are the presidential inaugural speeches. Of course, we were doing this on, on internal data, but this is external data that you can play with yourself. And we thought maybe this would be a way of, unsupervised, in an unsupervised way, identifying clusters like, is this present a Republican or a Dem Democrat or something really significant. And it didn't turn out to be that way. So the lesson learned here was that um, these, these unsupervised learning techniques are not always um, going to produce the answer that you're expecting. They're going to produce some other information about, about the data. Uh, and so we ended up going away from, from unsupervised learning to more supervised learning. But just to, if you want to play around with unsupervised learning, you can see how, how this lines up the presidents um, in, this, in this chart here. This, this is the, the connection between presidents according to the words they used in their speeches um, using frequency analysis. And 
um, the latent frequencies. And you can see that there, there are some outliers out here. Um, there's, there are people like Bush and Nixon who uh, tend to use very unusual language in their, in their speeches. <laughs> and, and if you try to push them together, they, they won't, they, the, the Democrats and Republicans don't, don't like to be together. They don't like to be real close together, but they don't really stick to their, uh, to their, uh, to their, to their co cohorts either. If you try to put them all together with their other Republicans, they don't do well there either. So this is obviously not, this is not classifying by, by, um, by political party or anything that was, is recognizable except the words they use. So um, this, is a, this is an example of, like, like Twitter showed, this is a, a two-dimensional slice, a two-dimensional um, uh, projection of your, of your frequency um, matrices. But um, it gives you some information about your data, but it, it may not be the whole story. Oh, let's see. I don't know. I can't see it from here anyway. Yeah, I think it was Carter. I'm going to look on my screen. I can. Yep, Carter, 1977, his speech. Um, Johnson, uh, 1965 Democrat, also had a, an outlier speech. Um, interestingly, this, this thing will shuffle out in a slightly different way every time you run it. Um, but the outliers tend to always be the same. So I'm looking at my screen, and I've got a slightly different view of that same stuff, but the outliers are the same. Are they more alike than dissimilar? Yes, the, there's a presidents tend to speak alike. That's what this story is, except for the real oddballs like Carter, Bush, and Nixon. Oh, sorry. I think we have to take uh, offline questions for that. So thank you for sharing that.